we'll start by going before the Lord in prayer. Ask the Lord to help us. And uh, if you don't pray for me, and uh, then you get what you get. <laughs> I will pray real hard. It might take a little bit of time to pray. But let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Uh, give us His Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. A spirit of wisdom, and we want wisdom. Any man that lacks wisdom, let him ask him of God, and we can all be in freedom. And so we want to uh, ask the Lord to give us wisdom and let his Holy Spirit guide us and direct us. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you, we come in the name and the merit of Jesus Christ, your Son. God, we're so grateful today, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to gather together your name, Lord, to study your word and to study the principles of your word. God, we pray today that your spirit would uh, rise up within us, Lord, to give us understanding. Lord, not only of your word, but your ways, your will. Lord, may the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you arise within our souls, the eyes of understanding and light. We might know your word, your will, and your ways as never before. God, anoint us, Lord. Bring to my mind and my memory all those things you have to say. I want to say them the right way. Lord, I know it's every one of our minds, Lord, to have spiritual understanding in our hearts to receive your word with meekness. Lord, we ask you to be magnified in everything that is said and done here today. We love you, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our class is uh, on church business, and uh, we're going to again talk some biblical principles about church business. And then we'll get into some practical things uh, toward the middle of the end of the week of uh, quarterly uh, uh, conferences, organizing church, and church business, and those kind of things. But we want to establish certain things from uh, the Word of God about uh, the business of the church. Um, our lesson, Sunday school lesson, is on and that's really going along with what our uh, lesson is today. So when we think about why does the church is, what is the reason why God has put the church on this earth? And uh, to answer that question, uh, well, the Bible answers the question for us. One of the things that we're here to do is we're here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. God didn't just save us and take us out of the world, but he left us here to, to preach the gospel to the world. That's, that's to keep us focused. And then uh, uh, we're also to teach those that we win to the Lord the, the teachings of Christ, the doctrines of Christ, so that they can understand. I would add one more thing to that at the beginning. So we preach the gospel, we teach the doctrines of Christ, and uh, I would say the church also exists, it's important to understand this, the church also exists to protect the gospel and the teachings of Christ. And so uh, it's our responsibility not only to preach it, but to make sure. You know, you think about uh, why government is necessary, why we need uh, uh, the church's government. Well, you know, if people can go out and preach the gospel, how do you know somebody's not going to preach the wrong gospel? And if somebody preaches the wrong gospel, what do you do? Do you just let it go? Do you just let it, uh, uh, let it uh, preach some false gospel? The Apostle Paul talks about uh, to the Galatians, if any man preach any other gospel than you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He was confident he had received the gospel by revelation of Jesus Christ. And there was no other gospel, and he was very quick to stand against anyone that, uh, that perverted that gospel. And so the church not only proclaims the gospel, but we protect the elements of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he rose again, and that salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But it also uh, demands repentance. And so many of the Gospels that are being taught today and preached today leave out the, the Gospel of repentance. And uh, the part of that, you know, we answer the question the Philippian jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So we tell what God has done to save people, but we also have to tell people 
what they must do to be saved. And so the church has to protect the gospel. Then we have to protect the teachings of Christ. And uh, so we have to have a, a system in place where we can hold people accountable that are teaching false doctrine. Uh, Jude, one of the last writers in the New Testament, uh, uh, writes and, and his whole uh, essence of the, the, that one chapter letter that we have from Jude was that he said, I felt compelled to tell you that we must earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. And so there, he was telling them, protect the gospel and teachings of Christ against those who would try, as Peter said, to, to uh, twist them. Or as Paul said, we're not as others which corrupt the word of God. There were those present that were corrupting the word of God. So Jude says you've got to earnestly contend against that. And so the church has government and structure so that we can uh, bring into account anyone that preaches another gospel or teaches another doctrine. So the business of the church is, first of all, to evangelize, to preach the gospel. Secondly, the business of the church is to um, to teach the, the, the doctrines of Christ to people, and thirdly, to protect the gospel and teachings of Christ from being perverted and, uh, and, and, and changed from what God had given them. So let's look at some of the scriptures that we have from the Lord just as he gets ready to leave, uh, to ascend back to heaven. Very familiar scriptures. We call it the Great Commission, uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye in all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So he gives them the great commission. Here's what I want you to do. Go preach the gospel till every person in the world has heard the gospel. Then over in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew expands upon that a little bit more in what Jesus said. He says in verses 19 through 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So not only are we to preach the gospel, but we're to teach them to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded. And so that's the, the mission of the church. Uh, one of the things that you hear people use in modern Christianity, they bring in elements of um, uh, secular um, business practices, and they'll say, in order for your company to be successful, you need a mission statement. You need a mission statement. I've heard that a lot over the last few years. What's your church's mission statement? We need to come up with a mission statement. Well, the reality is the church has already come up with a mission statement. God, Christ gave us the mission statement to keep us focused on what our business is. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel till every creature has heard the gospel. And so that's our mission statement. And the reason why they want them to have a mission statement is to make sure they focus all of their efforts and resources and energy on fulfilling what they're here to do. Well, ours is to go into all the world. So we have to focus all our time, all our energy, all our talents, all our finances uh, on the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another term they'll use is your core values. What are your core values? We want to make sure we got our core values right. And all these things sound so plastic to me, but uh, that's just my personal, personal opinion on that. But I, I'm looking at it thinking you, your, your core values were given to you by the Lord. The Lord gave you your core values. So Jesus, when he gives the Great Commission, says go and preach the gospel and teach them to observe all things. He's making sure the church never gets off task. This is what I want you to focus on. This is why I've left you in the world. He created the church then to proclaim the gospel, but not only proclaim the gospel and teachings of Christ, but to protect it and to protect the gospel and teaches of Christ, you have to have government. Uh, that's what the Pentecost, or rather the Protestant movement has, has, uh, has left behind. It's what Brother Phillips talks about, the visible church myth. That's why you have over 40,000 different denominations and independent Christian movements in the world, because they don't understand what the church is and the purpose of the church. 
The purpose of the church is not just to proclaim the gospel, but to protect it and to hold people accountable. And you can't do that without government. You can't do that with a, a, a mutual understanding and then to hold people accountable to that. Uh, that's impossible. How did we come up with 40,000 different denominations in, in, in just 500 years in Protestantism? And that, that number's growing. It's probably over 50,000 by now. How do, you, how do you come up with that? Well, when you take away the concept of the church and that you let everybody, well, you know, people will use the term, they'll say, uh, on the essentials, unity, on the non-essentials, liberty. And I, I remember somebody one time on a, on a chat on, on the computer said that. They said, on the essentials, unity, on the non-essentials, liberty. And I said, I wrote back on that chat board and I said, that sounds great. Now, what are the essentials? And not one person answered. And the reason is the minute you start saying that doctrines are essential, essential, that means there has to be accountability if you teach against it or preach against it. And that's what the Protestant movement doesn't want to do. It's built around tolerance. It's built on, you know, you teach what you teach, I'll teach what I teach, and we're not going to really mess with each other, you know, if you have a different understanding. And at first, when it was about whether you should be dipped or sprinkled or whether it's progressive or, or instantaneous sanctification, even though those things are important, those weren't things that are we're seeing now. The things we're seeing now is, uh, can you practice homosexuality and go to heaven? And so they were used to just saying, well, you believe in sprinkling, I believe in immersion, you believe in instantaneous sanctification, I believe in progressive sanctification. And we're just, you know, I, I have my strong beliefs about this, but, you know, I'll let you slide with that. But now you're talking about what the Bible calls damnable heresies. You're talking about doctrines that if a person believes it and practices it, they're going to hell. And so you can't be, then it becomes an essential thing where you, you've got to hold people accountable. So the, the church has to have uh, that understanding that we're not only to proclaim the gospel and teachings of Christ, but we have to be, the church exists to protect it. And, and uh, that's the whole concept of Israel in the Old Testament. We'll talk about that next week in, or this week in the Old Testament class. Uh, so we've got to keep focused. The business of the church is evangelism and to teach. Some businesses sell food. Some businesses sell cars. Some businesses sell computers. Our business is evangelizing and teaching the world. So everything we do has to be on, uh, uh, shaped around that, that, that mission. That's our business. That's the business of the church. Everything we do on an international level is shaped by that responsibility. Everything we do on the regional level is shaped by that vision. Everything you do on the local level has to be shaped by that vision. Uh, Jesus said when he was 12 years old, he told his parents, Did you not know I must be about my father's business? And we've got to be about our father's business. We can get sidetracked with trivial things and and things that seem on the surface to be important. I'll give you an example. When the Salvation Army started out, it was uh, uh, they, they were helping people. Well, uh, this is a, a little-known fact. A guy that works with Salvation Army told me this. Uh, back in the 1800s, uh, William Booth got concerned about the drunks in, in London that were littering the sides of the streets, and so he decided they needed help. So he took his buckboard and his horse and he would go and he would pick up these drunks and he would bring them back to his house and he'd sober them up and feed them and then he'd preach the gospel to them and they'd get saved. So every night he'd go out and he'd pick up these drunks on the side of the road, put them in his wagon and bring them over and sober them up and feed them and preach the gospel to them. That was the beginnings of the Salvation Army. In fact, he became so well known for that that if a policeman saw a drunkard on the side of the road in London, that the policeman would say, well, that one must have fell off the wagon. And that's where they got that expression, he fell off the wagon from. And, uh, but that's what they were known for. But General Booth's thing was not about alcohol rehabilitation. It wasn't about feeding the hungry. And uh, the Salvation Army is known about these charitable things and setting up their little red barrels and, and, and raising money for these charitable causes. 
But you can get caught up in that and forget that the real purpose behind even benevolent things is evangelism. Churches can get caught up in saying, hey, we enjoy getting together and fellowshipping, and that's fellowshipping is something we, we're supposed to do. But it can't take us away from the business of God, which is evangelizing and then teaching the doctrines of Christ. That's our Father's business, and we've got to be about our Father's, our father's work. It's the most important mission in the world. There's nothing greater than this. Um, you know, there are great charities in the world. Um, we have a, a right here in Cleveland, a young girl that's, um, the parents are friends with my daughter and her husband, and uh, their, their young daughter has been battling cancer for the last few years, and, and uh, she's been over at St. Jude. St. Jude's will take care of them, give them their treatment, and do all for nothing, no, no fee at all. And uh, that's because people donate to St. Jude's, and I think that's a great, great cause. Uh, there are other causes like uh, people opening soup kitchens and, and people sending food to, to the hungry and uh, people opening orphanages. And we have orphanages in Zion Assembly. But that's not where all of my finances, that's not the focus of my finances. The focus of my finances is the business of the church because more important than healing somebody's physical body with some kind of medicine or treatment, more important than making sure they're, they're fed and don't starve to death or have clothes uh, to wear to keep them warm or shelter to keep them uh, sheltered from the elements, more important than that by far is the salvation of their soul. Because if their body gets well, they're still going to die. Even the people Jesus healed, they still died eventually. As wonderful as it was for them to restore him to restore their sight, Eventually they died. So Jesus' main goal was not to come to, to heal the sick. His main goal was to save souls. And the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we are laborers, and that's our business. And so that's the great charity that, that we give to. We give to the work of the Lord. There's nothing greater you can get. You know, I would love to be able to give to all of these causes, but I have a limited amount of resources. So you do what you can because you have a heart for people that are hurting. And so you want to do things for them. But my main focus is like uh, our brothers here from other countries, missions and evangelism. And if that's not what we've got local churches for is to evangelize the community, then we've lost the whole reason for our existence. And if we're not an outpost, a soul-saving station, then we've lost our, our focus on what we're here for. That's why Jesus said the last words I want to leave you with. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So we evangelize them, then we teach them, we train them to go out. As Brother uh, uh, Farrell said last night so beautifully, that, that, that the church is a boot camp where you prepare soldiers to go out into the community and get people saved. This is the great cause. And uh, I talk, taught our Sunday school class this last Sunday, and I told them, I said, I'm really going to have to incorporate some of next week's lesson into this week because to talk about my purpose, I have to talk about the church's purpose because my purpose is tied to the church's purpose. Um, I, I remember just before I went to pastor, the last church I went to in the former organization, former fellowship, I was getting ready uh, to preach and I was sitting up late one night and I turned the television channels, you know how you flip through the channels, and I came across an infomercial by Tony Robbins, a famous motivational speaker. And I was flipping through, flipping through, and just as I flipped on his, he said, you know what the secret to success in life is? And I went, and I went back. I said, okay, let's hear what somebody from a non-Christian background, has to say is the secret to success in life. And he surprised me because I thought he would say it's about making money or it's about having this or that. Instead, he said the secret to success in life is purpose. And he says it's not goals. He says goals are, are things you set and then you work to achieve them and you celebrate them when you achieve them. He says, but purpose is what gets you up in the morning. Purpose is what motivates your life. 
Purpose is what you go to bed thinking about and go to sleep thinking about. It drives your life. He says, if you can find purpose in life, you'll find the secret to happiness in life. And I remember so distinctly thinking as I listened to him, I thought the same thing Jesus said about that man one time, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You're absolutely right. The secret to fulfillment in life is to have purpose. The one thing you're missing is there's only one purpose. There's only one thing that really matters in this world, and that's getting people saved. Nothing else matters. Now, I'm all for uh, orphanages, but we don't have orphanages just to shelter children. We have orphanages to teach children about Christ. We don't just feed the hungry. We feed the hungry that, that we might glorify our Father which is in heaven, point them to Jesus Christ, letting the goodness of God lead them to repentance. Uh, I heard about an organization that was digging wells in, in villages that didn't have clean water. And it was a Christian organization. They said, what we'll do is we're going to dig a well in that town, but we're going to dig it in the courtyard of the, the, the church. And so when people come to get water, they come to the church to get water. And their thinking was, we want them to associate this good act with Christ. And so everything we do whether it's charitable or not, we're obviously called on to do charitable work, and you can't help it. If you're a child of God, you got the love of God in your heart, you want to help those that are in need. But my goal is not just to feed them or clothe them or shelter them or to educate them as a child, you know, and the, 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 to, to make an, a living when they get older. My purpose is to, uh, is to lead them to Christ. And so go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's overwhelming when you think about it. Uh, how in the world can we accomplish that mission? Uh, there, there are nearly 8 billion people in the world. Uh, what was it? Uh, nearly 7,000, right around 7,000 languages. Uh, there are 195 nations, I think at last count, 195 nations in the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, that was overwhelming to the, the early church when they, that was given to them. And they didn't have any planes and they didn't have any mass means of communication. Uh, the, you know, the, the boats that they had to get to some of these places. Paul said, I was shipwrecked three times. I like to point out to people, you realize that Paul said, I was shipwrecked three times. That's before the one that he was shipwrecked with uh, in, in Acts. So he was shipwrecked four times. So even getting around in those circumstances was very difficult. Brother Radar, you have to come to the microphone. And even back then, the world was smaller. Mm -hmm. They didn't realize how big the world actually was. Right. right. Actually, that's exactly right. And uh, so you look at it today and you think, you know, that the task is overwhelming. I, I am in a pastor in a little town that has two street lights in it. And I think to myself, that's a big task, you know? And, and then I go out for the school of ministry in California and I stand in San Bernardino, which flows all the way in. All those towns flow into Los. You can't tell when you left Los Angeles. You stand on the edge of that and said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And you're thinking, how in the world can we ever, we ever do these things? But that's the business of the church. Um, again, it's to evangelize, it's to teach. It's also, uh, I'll, I'll add one more thing to the local level especially, and that's to care for the saints. Uh, and there's, we, we care for them in, in a lot of different ways. Um, we care for their spiritual needs, we care for their physical needs. What's my responsibility in the local church? What's my responsibility as a pastor? Uh, to care for, the, to care for the, the sheep, to care for the people. And so the early church uh, had all kinds of responsibilities on the, the, the physical and financial level to the people of the church. I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but you, you look at the early church and it was, it was different than we are today in, in this sense. Uh, they really didn't have church buildings. They, they went to synagogues. They went to the temple. 
I think the only church building I could find that you could really say that, well, they had a building was uh, when uh, uh, the Bible says Paul was in Ephesus and for a short while, a couple of years, he taught in the school of Tyrannus, which seems to be a, some kind of private synagogue, and he was allowed to teach there, so they didn't really have that. But so their financial uh, uh, responsibilities in the church, which well, that's part of business, right, is the financial part of it. Their financial parts were not to pay for buildings, but to make sure that each one was taken care of in their physical needs. Uh, they lived in a time when you didn't have social programs to care for widows and orphans, and especially if they became Christians, they weren't going to take care of them. And so Paul writes to Timothy about those that are widows indeed, and that's the ones that don't have any family that can take care of them at all. He says that falls to the church to help take care of them. And then he talks about, uh, James talks about pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. So they took care of the orphans. They took care of the widows. Uh, the early church went through such persecution in Jerusalem that at that time, uh, they, they had to, the people were, were in danger of not even having a way to make a living. You know, their businesses were shutting down. We're not going there. They're Christian people or uh, whatever. And so what did they do? They came and laid their money at the apostles' feet and said, distribute it to every man as he has need. And some of them that had some extra property would sell that property and bring the money and lay it at the apostles' feet and say, if anybody needs it, the widows, the orphans, if any. In fact, the first, the first problem the early church had in Acts 6 was about the distribution of funds to the widows, where some being preferred over others. But that's where their focus was. And their other focus that you see in the New Testament was that they were, were collecting funds for others that were going through famine in other parts of the world or they were supporting missionaries to go on their, their causes, or to support the ministry, the local ministry. Paul goes into great detail right into Corinthians, how that you don't muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn, uh, talking about uh, if the ox is working, you let it eat. And so he says the same principle applies to the, the minister. You take care of the minister's needs. If he's supplying your spiritual needs, you take care of him financially. So they were concerned with missionary. They were concerned with their local minister. They were concerned with the widows and orphans. They were concerned with their church members that might be being persecuted and didn't have any way to take care of themselves. Listen, now we're not as focused on that right now, but I'm telling you, things are changing. Uh, we could very well be in that situation again, where the government puts down the clamps on us and all of a sudden we, we have members that are suffering, if you got to the place in the, with the mark of the beast where you can't buy or sell, you know, the, wouldn't it put pressure on whoever's there? Lord willing, I'm out of here. But, wouldn't it, but if that kind of pressure starts coming, that you're going to have to take care of each other. So right now, you know, we have programs that may take care of some of the poor in our church from the government, but there may come a time when we're having to focus on that again. But we also have our, our situations where we have to, uh, now we, we said, well, it'd be better if we had facilities that we could worship in. And, and we need to be careful on that, that we don't get extravagant on that, to where all your money is spent on a building. You know, at the end of the day, that, that's where Catholicism got into it. When they, uh, right after the, the great falling away in Catholicism, let's build cathedrals because they were having that temple mentality that if you want to honor your God, your God, his temple has to be elaborate. But really, we, we've got to stay focused on this. And let me, let me just share a word of warning with you that there may come a time when they seize your properties or they don't allow you to gather in properties uh, uh, in, that are set aside for Christian things. Some people, parts of the world are already dealing with that situation. So we have all of these responsibilities that we have, all the financial responsibilities that we have in taking care of the work of the Lord. That's the business of the church. So if we're going to have church facilities, we've got to pay for them. If you're going to pay for them, you've got to have uh, record keeping and finances. And then the government wants to know where your money's at. And uh, they want to know uh, maybe less right now than what it was before. But, you know, if you want to take it off on your taxes, somebody's got to give you a record of it. And tell us so all these things have to be done. And, and it could be even worse in the future. 
Um, but the good news is, as overwhelming as the task is, God's given us the people to do it, to do the task. And uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. It's ch uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And Brother Rick uh, read some of this scripture last night. Starting at verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. He gave. He gave. How did he give them? He, he gifted them. He, he prepared them for this particular role. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and past, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Listen, this is important. It, do, it doesn't say for these three reasons. It says the, the ministry is for the perfecting of the saints so that the, the saints can do the work of the ministry. You understand what I'm saying? So the, the job of the ministry is for the perfecting of the saints so they can do the work of the ministry. That the, that the, 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 for the edifying of the body of Christ, the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he gave apostles and prophets, they laid the foundation of the church, were, were built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and they laid it out. Uh, and it's all centers around Jesus and the gospel of Jesus and the doctrines of Jesus. That's why Paul said, No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It all centers around Jesus. In fact, you read the book of Colossians, and we'll talk about this next week in the, the New Testament class. But in the book of Colossians, he's constantly saying, in him, in him, in whom, in him, in whom, in him, rooted and grounded in him. Everything that the gospel is about centers around Jesus and what he did on the cross. Our doctrines are not our own. They're the doctrines of Jesus. And so uh, the, the apostles and prophets, they laid the foundation of the church. They gave us. And then it's recorded in the pages of the Bible. So we have the New Testament as our only rule of faith, practice, government, and discipline. Why? Because it was the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. And so everything centers around Jesus. So he gave the apostles and prophets to lay the foundation. He gave evangelists. These are people that are gifted to be able to evangelize. Evangel, evangelize, evangelism, evangelist is all, the word evangel is, where, is our word gospel. Uh, An evangelist is one who shares the gospel. Evangelism is the practice of sharing the gospel. And God has gifted certain people to be able to evangelize in, in, in different ways. Uh, one, there are some people that can get up and, uh, God has made them extroverted people. They can get up in front of a crowd and they can talk to people. One of the biggest fears that people have, one of the most common fears, is public speaking. Uh, some people can't do it. I mean, my father-in-law, if you, if you, if you say his name, he'll turn blood red, much less get up in front of people. It's just not his nature to do that. He's very good at other things. That's not his thing. And... Uh, but God has given people. You ever seen, you ever heard the expression, that person could talk to a wall? There are some people, I had a friend of mine one time, uh, his wife and me and Babs were in the car and he got out to get his ice creams at Dairy Queen. There's a line at Dairy Queen. And by the time he got to the window, he had talked to everybody in that line. It's just in him. And uh, there's some people like that. They can get up and they can talk to crowds and it's not... Elwood Matthews was a God-called evangelist, if you knew who Elwood Matthews was. He could get up in front of a crowd. He'd almost run to the pulpit to get to the front. And he had just a way of communicating that I always said, wow, that's so... You know, you admire it because you realize, wow, what a beautiful thing. And you realize, I've come to realize that's a gift that God has given certain people. And uh, he has it. He had it. Uh, there's other people that are excellent at personal evangelism. Now, get up in front of a crowd. They're not, that's not their thing. But I'm going to tell you something. They can sit down on a park bench and talk to somebody about Christ just like that. 
my dad was uh, big into personal evangelism. And uh, as mentioned at his funeral, I came home one time and he had been teaching this class on evangelism explosion. He was all fired up about personal evangelism. My mom said, Bruce, will you talk to your dad? I said, what's he doing? He says, he's picking up hitchhikers. <laughs> and, I, and I said, what's he doing that for? He because he's witnessing to them. And I, I'm looking at it thinking, well, mom, there's not, I'm not going to stop him from doing that. But that's just, he loved it. It was in his fiber of being. But the, if anybody knows the evangelism explosion program, it's built around two questions. The first one is, uh, if you were to die tonight, you know, without a doubt, you'd go to heaven to be with Jesus. And I told him at my dad's funeral, I said, now that would have been frightening to be picked up as a hitchhiker. And a man turned and looked at you that picked you up and said, do you know, without a doubt, if you were to die tonight, You'd go to heaven to be with Jesus. But some people are just gifted at personal evangelism. God's, God's given them that gift. Um, so in the New Testament, the apostles and, and, and evangelists, they went into town, they preached the gospel. Today we have missionaries and we have evangelists that go into different communities. And then when people receive Christ, they need pastoring uh, to take care of them. Um, and then they need deacons to take care. The deacons that we, we get for, is from uh, Acts chapter 6 where they had the problem with the widows being taken care of. They ran into financial difficulties. They said, okay, search you out seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. We can put over this business. And so uh, uh, God gifted certain people that have a gift of finances they can handle. You know, have you noticed that there's some people good with money and some are not? That's not an accident either. Some people are just able to do it. And so uh, you look in 1 Timothy and you look in Titus and Paul writes about uh, the qualifications for bishops and deacons. And they laid hands on these men and commissioned them for the work of the Lord, both the spiritual and physical aspects. Because the reason why the deacons were given was because they wanted them to take care of that financial part and leave the apostles freed up for the work of the ministry and, and preaching the word and, and prayer. And so I don't want to be distracted by all this, this financial stuff. And I can tell you that right now. I'd rather never have to get up and do a business conference at the church. I'd rather the deacons take care of that because to, to, you have to give some spiritual oversight to that. But the reality is I, I don't want to be bothered with that. And, and, and it seems like a bother sometimes. But they were to oversee the business of the church, to evangelize, to teach, to care, to make sure that the finances that came in to supply all of this were part of it. Brother Rick talked about uh, last night that the church is an army. But not everybody's on the front lines in the infantry. My dad spent 21 years in the military as a, in supply. But if that guy doesn't have his bullets and he doesn't have his gun, he can't fight his battle. And so there are people that God has gifted in certain ways to supply what is needed for the work of the ministry. Uh, to me, you find what you can do and, and you do it and you say, okay, I'm going to be about God's business and, and I'm going to help any way I can. I think that's what you see with Dorcas. That, that, that Peter prayed for and she rose from the dead. They said, look at all these wonderful things that she's made. And we used to have in the church years ago something called the Dorcas Club where the women would get together and they'd make different crafts and they'd sell it and then take the money for missions. See, that's people getting involved in the business of God. And so I know here at, at, in Cleveland, they do a lot of yard sales and different things to try and raise funds for missions. And so all of this has to be taken care of. It's part of the, the mission of the church. And so we've got to continue that. Um, again, he's, he's gifted certain men as pastors and teachers. And, uh, you know, God prepares somebody for their work their whole lives, whether they realize that's what they're going to be or not. You know, there's certain things that happen in your life that make you the person you are. And God sometimes is, is working on pastors and teachers. In Acts 20 and 28, uh, when Paul is going to, uh, to Ephesus, he's, he's actually passing by Ephesus. He says, I think this is going to be my last time here. I, I don't think you'll see my face again anymore. He calls for the elders and he tells them these words, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. 
over the flocks which the Lord hath made you overseers. Flocks, what's he got in mind when he says the word flocks? It's sheep. And he's made you overseers of the sheep. Who's an overseer of a sheep? A shepherd. And what uh, the word shepherd is pastor. That's what the word pastor means, is shepherd. And, and he says, what does he say? To feed, literally to tend the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Why does he add that last part in there? Which he hath purchased with his own blood. Doesn't he, isn't he trying to, don't you think he's trying to get them to understand the value of the people you're caring for in the eyes of God? I've left you there to oversee the flock, to tend them. I purchased them with my own blood. And, and so we have to take great care in taking care of those that God has put in us. We care for them. We protect them from being led astray. We help them. We train them. We help them to grow. I'm talking about the business of the church. Teach, preach, train to teach and preach. You know, I mean, everything we do is to get people on board in the work, work of God. Uh, remember Brother Tomlinson, A.J. Tomlinson. In fact, I think they still have the sign up in the old First Assembly House out there. Uh, a work forever member, a member forever work. May have that backwards. A, a work forever member, a member forever work. Everybody involved in the work of God. Getting people involved in the work of God. Uh, getting them saved and then plugging them in and getting them. Again, the task is overwhelming. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every, cre every creature. Well, I can't do that. Of course you can't. Paul was a great minister, but he couldn't do it. God didn't intend for one person to do it. That's part of the concept of the body of Christ, is that we are members in particular. And that just like the human body has many members and they all have their own function, the God's designed the church with people that are gifted in certain ways to fulfill different functions. Your heart does a certain work that you have to have it. But it doesn't do the same work as my liver does. My liver has a function and the heart can't operate without the liver, and the liver can't operate without the heart. Every person in the body of Christ has been prepared by God and placed here for one thing, uh, for, for the mission uh, uh, of the church, the mission of God to, to preach the gospel, to teach the doctrines of Christ, to protect the gospel and teachings of Christ, and to help care for the people, care for the sheep. And that's, that's our business. And... Uh, you know, don't get distracted. You're here for a reason. God didn't save you and take you out of this world. God left you here for a purpose. And we can get sidetracked by trivial things because we have to have the necessities of life. You know, you can get caught up in, in work. You can get caught up in children. Listen, if you work, Understand this, no matter how much you train for your job, and you have to, you know, better to have a job you'd like than one that you don't, right? You're going to have to work. You've got to, the Bible says man doesn't work, neither let him eat. And so we're, we're expected to do that, but we can't get sidetracked and think, well, that's what I'm here for, is to be an electrician or be a, a carpenter. I tell people all the time, if you're a carpenter that's a Christian, you're not a carpenter who happens to be a Christian. You're a Christian who happens to be a carpenter. Your purpose is whatever God put you here to fulfill. Uh, I, I, I pointed out in the church just the other day, and I never really thought about this. About, you know, two of Paul's friends and workers, fellow laborers, was Priscilla and Aquila. And the Bible talks about them in a few places. But the Bible says the reason why Paul and them gravitated together at the beginning was that they were, had a common trade. They were tent makers. But I don't think anybody here, if I describe, said, well, what, do you, what was the Apostle Paul? What was his purpose? He was here to be a tent maker. That's not who Paul was. It's what Paul did to supply the needs of the ministry that he was involved in. But his, his focus was on the ministry God had called him to. And all of us are the same way. Whether you're... you're, you're Position or, or work in the body of Christ is something that others don't take a lot of notice of. It's important to God, and it is your purpose. It's your reason for being. And so all the other things, 
the fact you work as an electrician or work on computers or whatever you do, that's not your, that's not what defines you. What defines you is the purpose of God. You, you understand that that's why, one of the reasons why we gather together on the first day of the week to remind ourselves constantly, this is the focus of my life. This is the number. Why do you think God tells us to give our first fruits and not our last fruits? To keep us reminded of our purpose, to keep us reminded of what the church's business is, that that's the most important thing in your life is your relationship with God and helping other people to have a relationship with God. <laughs> And so every Sunday you get up and you go to church, you drag yourself in when your body sometimes doesn't feel like it because you want to remind yourself, this is what my life is about. And we get distracted. The cares of this life, the pleasures of this world, the deceitfulness of riches try and bind us up so that we become unfruitful. Not just to kill us, but to make us unfruitful in the work of the Lord. And so we've got to make sure that we stay focused on the things of God. Uh, Brother Phillips' uh, book, uh, Building God's House, that's been a theme of ours from this rest, beginning of our restoration, Building God a House. Paul talks about that in, uh, in talking to the Corinthians about building the temple of God and don't defile the temple of God. God will destroy you. I've laid the foundation as a wise master builder and another comes and builds thereon. So the idea of building the house of God being like the work of the church is something that goes all the way back. Not only to then, it goes all the way back to Moses. And when Moses goes up on the mountain and God tells him to build the, the tabernacle, remember that? God says, now I want you to do this, and this is going to be made out of gold, and this is going to be made out of silver, and this is going to be made out of bronze. And he says, and, I, I, and, and you're going to have to have these tapestry works, these curtain works, and they're going to have to be different colors and different things. And Moses is looking at this like, what in the world? He wants me to do all of this, all of these clothings for these, these high priests and all these other things. And you remember what God told him? He says, and I have put the wisdom in the hearts of these men, and he names them by name. And he says, and they're going to do these things. You just tell them what you need. And that to me is so much the work of the, the, the building of the house of God. That to, to finish the business of God, God has put the skills in everybody's hearts and lives to be able to do it. Uh, he gave gifts unto men. And he gave you your gift. And you've got to find it. And you've got to put it into practice in the work of the Lord. This is the business of God. And I've got to be about the business of God. Uh, and, and so uh, if you don't do anything else in your life, you have to find out what God's gifted you to do in the church. What can I do to build God's house? What can I do in the work of the Lord? Romans 12, 6 talks about then having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth with ex on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Again, we don't have all the same gifts. You know, I have certain abilities and gifts that God's given me. Whatever it is, it's a gift from God, right? What does Paul say? Who maketh thee to differ one from another? What do you have that you have not received? Why dost thou glory as though thou hadst not received it? See, we can get so caught up in our giftedness in certain areas that we can get a big hit. And we start thinking, nobody. I had a guy tell me this one time, and this is, a, this is the truth. As you're climbing each mountain, each level with God, when you get to the top of each level, be careful because the devil fights you all the way up. When you get to the top, what he tries to do is push you off the other side. So he fights you from praying, fights you from studying the Word of God, fights you from doing the work of the ministry and fulfilling it. And when you start to do these things, you know what he does? He says, there's nobody that prays like you. There's nobody that knows the Bible like you. The pastor needs to be educated because you know more than he knows. And I've seen it happen over and over again. 
Pride is always the enemy of giftedness. Think, listen to what I'm telling you, because that's from the Lord today. Pride is always the enemy of giftedness. Because you can start thinking, my musician talents, my singing, my preaching, whatever my, my, my education that God has given me to be able to understand. And like Paul, Paul not only understood the mysteries of God, but he was able to communicate them in a way that people can understand. And that was a gift from God, and Paul knew it. Why did Paul get a thorn in the flesh? Lest he be exalted above measure. And pride is always the enemy. I've seen guys that were, uh, I've seen them on television. I, I think of two right off the top of my head that just before they fell, just before they backslid, they made statements very similar to each other. One said, God has told me that if I don't get this work done, it's not going to get done. I'm God's man of the hour. Doom, right off the end. Well, God, God will raise somebody else up, just like he told, Mordecai told Esther. You may not do it, but God will raise deliverance somewhere else. And so you can get this prideful thing about you to where you be, nobody can tell you anything anymore. You begin to despise government. And you, you, know, you, you begin to think, and then you think, I've got this gift so I can go out and the world can see me. I think one of the most tragic things is to see young people that uh, are on these, these television programs and trying to be stars, singers. And they'll ask them about their background. They'll say, well, I was raised in church, sang in church. And I thought, what are you doing there? What are you doing anywhere else but there? I was telling the church the other day, I tuned into this, this Baptist church from Louisiana the other day, and this little girl got up, and there was nothing about her appearance that made you think she was trying to put on a show. I mean, just very plain in her, her manner. And, I, and, I, and this choir's behind her, and older people, and here she is, this young person, and she opened her mouth, and when she opened her mouth, wow. I thought, she's there in that church? She could be making records somewhere. I mean, I say records. You know what I'm talking about. I'm aging myself by saying records. <laughs> Let's get out the stereo and play some records. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm talking about? She had such a beautiful voice. And I'm thinking, well, that's not an accident. I want to tell all these people, you all these singers that act like, look at what I can do. I'm thinking, and how did you get it? Nobody taught you that or trained you. People can teach me all day long how to sing. I'm never going to sound like that. Right? I, and, and it's the same way with people on pianos. Um, my dad played, uh, played. He, he, he typed in his work with the military. And I used to stand there and watch my dad and go, wow. His fingers would go over that keyboard. Just, thrr, thrr, and I'd be like this. Just make, I can't make a mistake. I got to make sure, you know. Then, and it skipped a generation because my son did one of these things online where keyboard speed tests, and he came in the top 10 in the world. Just, and I'll watch my son. And I'm thinking, well, who makes thee to differ one from another? Piano player gets up there. Somebody else study their whole life can never do that. You either got it or you don't. Singers, singing is a beautiful example of that. You either got it or you don't. And I've seen people try to get out of their calling and say, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to sing. Can't sing. My mama told me that one time. She said, Bruce, don't let anybody fool you. You can't sing. <laughs> when your mama tells you that, you pretty well yeah. just say, okay. Yeah, don't need to do that. But some people have got it. I'll tell you one, I can prove this is the case, that God does it. I can prove this without a doubt, that God gives gifts to men. And one of it's art. I can sit down and probably, I don't know, I don't know who's here. And, uh, some people may have something that I don't know about. But I know that, uh, that, that I can sit down. You tell me, draw a picture of Wade Phillips. Give me a pencil and a pad. And I can sit there. When I get done, everybody in the room would laugh at what I drew because it looked like a stick man. You know, it, would, it wouldn't look anything like him. Nobody would be able to tell if you said, hey, who is this? And, and probably most everybody in this room, if not everybody in this room, be the same way. But I've seen other people. 
that can take a pencil and a pad and in just a few minutes draw a picture of Wade Phillips that looks exactly like him. Now, how do you explain that? You got gifts. And everybody in the church has something that they can do. There are some people, I saw my mother-in-law, uh, she passed away with Alzheimer's several years back, but she would go visiting with me sometimes to nursing homes. I love to take her to nursing homes. And I've seen her sit down and put a bib around somebody she's never met before and feed them. First time she's ever met them. Talk to them like she had known them all her life. And I'm thinking that's a gift. That's a gift. The Bible talks about those that show with mercy. You know, there are some people that have that capability. There are people that can work with children. I can't do it. I, somebody asked me to get up in front of a group of children and talk, and I am lost as lost can be. And uh, But others can get up in front of children and draw them in in a heartbeat. And those kids are listening to every word they say. And there's some way, way, that way with youth. They can talk to young people, and the young people. I, Brother Farrell's got me coming as the, the camp evangelist for their camp. And I said, well, I'll, I'll have to get me some jeans with some holes in it, and uh, I have to learn some of the vernacular of the, 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 the teenagers just teasing about trying to fit it. Because no matter what I did, I would just sound like a goof to them, you know. But uh, there are some people that can stand up in front of a group of young people, and they're in their element. Take them and put them in front of somebody else, and that's not their element. And boy, if you can, as a pastor, find those gifts in those people and plug them into those places, man, you've got something special. And then if people will accept that's their gift, you know, I've seen people try to get up and preach and they weren't called to preach. If they were called to preach, they could preach. And let's just be honest. People would hear what they say. They would be interested in what they had to say. It's just not what they're called to do. And that same person can sing like a bird and said, I don't want to sing. I'm thinking, why are you not singing? Or they can go out and personal evangelize circles around the, the preacher at the church, much better at it than the pastor. You understand what I'm saying? There's just gifts. And so the church, when we talk about the church business and all these things, we're going to talk about the practical parts of it and talking about uh, how to have a quarterly conference and handle the finances and discipline, all these things. All these things are elements that center around what the church's business is. We're here to preach the gospel to every creature. We're to teach them to observe all things whatsoever is commanded. The structure and government of the church exists to protect the gospel and teachings of Christ not only to proclaim it, but to protect it, and then to care for the saints, to make sure they're taken care of. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is when, when people go to the hospitals and sit down with somebody. I, you know, I had a guy at my church the other day, drove, he's not healthy at all, but he heard somebody was in the hospital probably 40 miles away from where he lived, drove 40 miles over there to sit with them in the hospital, and, but it's just in his heart to do it. And what a wonderful thing. Nursing home ministries. I know Brother, Brother Johnson's been involved in nursing home ministries. And these are wonderful things. But if we can find those gifts and help everybody. Uh, so we want to qualify every worker. We want to get them involved in the, the business of the Lord. Uh, let me close with this. Uh, we're going to talk about business, right? Financial part of the church. But look at the qualifications that they gave for deacons. In Acts chapter 6, it had nothing to do with finances. It had to do with being full of the Holy Ghost and of wisdom. And I'm telling you something, if you take somebody that's good with money that isn't full of the Holy Ghost, they'll make a mess out of things. Every, every worker in the church benefits from having a greater relationship with God. Every ministry improves their ministry by improving their relationship with the Lord. There's not a person that is a better, isn't better at what they do if they don't know more about the Word of God. That's why you're here this week, to learn more about the Word of God. No matter if you're a singer, let me tell you something. Singers and songwriters are good singers and songwriters because they know the God they're singing about and writing about, and they understand the principle. There's great theology, deep theology, in some of these things that are in these hymns. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. There's great theology in all of these. 
but God gifted people, and then those people pursued a relationship with the Lord and a knowledge of God that helped them be better. Wouldn't the business part of the church, the financial side of the church, work better if all the members were spiritual? The reason why we have trouble in all these things is because people aren't spiritual. Get people better in, in their spiritual life and, and their knowledge of the Lord and everything else will work better. Anybody got anything to say before we close out? God bless you. You can take a few minutes break. When, when's our next class start? All right, so you have about eight minutes.